this is Sakazuki, one of the most hated characters in all of the One Piece for all of the right reasons, as well as one of the mega beings set up to be a final saga antagonist. A man of extremely high expectations that we're going to examine because we are on a mission to rank every major antagonist in the most comprehensive and exhaustive way possible video by video, this time featuring the donut factory, Sakazuki. All right, let's clear one thing up right at the get-go because I get this question a lot whenever I speak about this dude. He's known as both Sakazuki and Akainu, the former of which is his real name and the latter of which is his admiral epithet, which he no longer carries because he's a fleet admiral now, hence why I just use his real name. So you don't have to leave your confused comments now. But Sakazuki has a very unique introduction because he's introduced through a character who is not him. In chapter 319, we catch our first glimpse of a Sakazuki-esque silhouette as we are made aware of the concept of the three marine admirals to which Nico Robin states, even at Navy headquarters, there are only three who hold the rank of admiral. Akainu, Aokiji, Kizaru. The world government calls these three the ultimate military force. And from here to some degree, Sakazuki's introduction is directly linked to that of Kuzan, as is Kizaru's, because these three admirals are a package deal. In pre-time skip One Piece, they are a collective, which is why the first time that we see Sakazuki outside of a flashback is the iconic triple throne shot of the three admirals waiting for the Whitebeard pirates. As far as One Piece villains go, you know, it's kind of an underwhelming first panel, but at the same time, he didn't need more than that, because by the time we actually saw Sakazuki, we experience the terror of two other admirals. On Long Ring Long Land with a single hand, Kuzan froze the ocean as far as the eye could see. And when it came to fight battling, our monster trio of Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji didn't even look like they belonged in the same series as him. This was like watching Goku go up against the Simpsons. In no universe were the Straw Hats coming out of this with anything but utter defeat, which reestablished the power ceiling of the One Piece world. Because remember that at this point, Luffy had just beaten the closest thing we'd ever seen to a god on Skypiea. So here, Luffy was immediately and brutally grounded. He was an insect in comparison to an admiral. And whatever one admiral is capable of, you can immediately assume that the others can do as well, which went on to be very true. As we would have a frighteningly similar experience on Sabadi Archipelago, where the supernovas were decimated by Admiral Kizaru, who also went on to be the cause of the eradication of the Straw Hat Pirates. All of this was in service of laying the foundation for Sakazuki, because we've now encountered two admirals, both of which were capable of soloing the crew, and one of them who actually succeeded in breaking them up. So ultimately, Sakazuki is the last but not least admiral to be showcased because he took everything that Kuzan and Kizaru built and made them look like we'd been playing the game on easy mode. And here, we're not just talking about power, although it is worth mentioning. Sakazuki is, of course, the wielder of what has been described by author Ichiro Oda as the devil fruit capable of conjuring the highest level of offensive power, which is the Magumagunumi, a Logia type that allows Sakazuki to conjure, manipulate, and become magma, which is an instant win against 99.9% .9 of One Piece characters, even accounting for those with Haki. But that aspect is not the most daunting part of Sakazuki. What makes him truly dangerous and a landmark antagonist for One Piece is his belief, which is why our first taste of Sakazuki doesn't involve any fighting at all. During Robin's flashback, we briefly see Sakazuki as a vice admiral, making the decision to destroy an evacuation ship full of innocent civilians. At the time, the island of Ohara was subject to a buster call because some scholars on the island were conducting some very naughty taboo research. And Sakazuki's logic for killing everyone was, if by chance even a single scholar is hiding out in that ship, all this sacrifice will be for naught. You must destroy evil at its very roots. And this is the philosophy of absolute justice, specifically Sakazuki's sub-brand thorough justice. Sakazuki is a justice perfectionist, which I think is best observed by Kobe during the Paramount War, where after the Marines had achieved victory, the war continued with Kobe be stating, this victory has only whetted their appetites. Sakazuki wasn't going to stop until he had kill murdered every last individual pirate on this battlefield, because letting even one of them live would not be stopping evil at its roots. That one escaped pirate would then go on to regrow and spread assorted evils all over the world again. Those are the brain thoughts of Sakazuki. And the reason why this man is so terrifyingly competent is because Sakazuki has a level of belief that rivals and perhaps even surpasses that of Luffy. Luffy his ideology is at least malleable to some extent. He's open to suggestions sometimes, but Sakazuki is not. There is no negotiating with him, and from his perspective, there is always a clear path to justice. And that path you know, generally involves your death. Because even if you're on his side, he expects others to embody his determination. During the Paramount War, Sakazuki encountered a Marine fleeing the battlefield because he had a family to take care of, and he was scared of leaving them alone. And in response, Sakazuki said, if you care about your family, then 
and die an honorable death before straight up murdering the dude. Think about that. The first living person attacked by Sakazuki in this war wasn't a pirate, wasn't a prisoner, wasn't a revolutionary. It was one of his own allies. But that's not how Sakazuki sees it. From his perspective, that ally was every bit as bad as an enemy because he wasn't prepared to enact the justice, meaning that he was likely to allow a root of evil to escape and thus making the sacrifice of Marineford ultimately meaningless. And look, I do believe that this hyper brutality does come from a genuine place of wanting to do good. Looking at the only image we currently have of Sakazuki as a child, he had quite a rough upbringing. The skid probably isn't even in double digits and he's already fighting for his life with a knife and what looks like blood stains all over his shorts, something that got censored from the officially animated version of this that we saw in the end credits of One Piece Film Z. It's a really creepy image. And you know, something that works well in horror is using children as a vehicle for the main monster because it represents that ultimate corruption of innocence. And I see that on full display with child Sakazuki, which only becomes infinitely more creepier when you see a whole squad of child Sakazuki lined up in ranks ready to completely dismantle every part of you. So you let me know in the comments, how many child Sakazukis do you think you could take in a fight? Because for the record, I don't think I could take any. But something interesting that you may or may not have noticed is that Sakazuki doesn't smile. And you know, this is kind of a big deal in One Piece, which thematically often boils down to a battle of smiles. In fact, Luffy's toughest opponents are often the ones who can smile just as wide as he can, which is a direct challenge to his ideology and his role as the Joy Boy. You've got a whole bunch of twisted Joy Boys running around trying to construct the world in their own image, but Sakazuki, weirdly enough, isn't one of them. And I think that's because he sees himself as a sacrificial piece, someone determined to build the perfect world, but with the knowledge that he won't be worthy of living in it. Although I should point out that he has smiled at one time, which was in response to Whitebeard telling him to stick to lighting candles on a birthday cake. A very funny joke. But that's the only time he's ever done that in the manga. I don't know about the anime. I don't keep track of all the smiles in the anime. Sometimes they add smiles, very bad of them. But even then in the manga, this smile didn't even crack Sakazuki's top lip. So whatever happened to Sakazuki as a child was not justice. And this is now him arguably overcompensating just a little bit to make sure that such injustice never happens to anyone else again. And as for who that anyone else could specifically be, it's heavily speculated that Commander Hibari is Sakazuki's daughter for a whole ton of reasons that I'm not gonna go into here, but I do have a full video on the topic if you're interested. With the ultimate conclusion being the idea that Sakazuki is trying to build that perfect world for his daughter to live in, and he's willing to personally enact any means so long as he reaches that endpoint. Again, to be clear, that is all speculation at this stage, but there is something like that driving Sakazuki. Most villains in One Piece tend to be a bit broken in some way, like say Crocodile and Gecko Moria, who failed to achieve their dreams and now being dicks as a result. But Sakazuki, scarily, is a man well on the path to his ambition and who will not follow Alter in the quest to find his own personal One Piece, something very much recognized by Oda, who once used him as an example of what not to do when creating a main protagonist, Oda said. When creating a character, one needs to be careful not to make them too strong. For example, if Akainu was the main character, the series wouldn't last a year because the dude has everything, maximum punch fighting power and relentless belief in what he's doing. And you know, if there's one panel that always haunts me, it's near the end of Marineford, where Sakazuki is still relentlessly approaching Ace, with with a massive chunk of his body missing, depicting him as this unstoppable Terminator-like existence. And you know, there was a point at the climax of Marineford where Sakazuki was taking on Jinbei Crocodile and all of the Whitebeard commanders at once, and they still couldn't stop him. In the end, it took the deus ex machina of Shanks arriving at Marineford for Luffy to be capable of surviving this encounter. And it's worth mentioning that Shanks being there wasn't originally planned. It was a very last minute decision by Oda, and I think a huge chunk of that was that he couldn't figure out any other way to logically have Luffy survive against such an overwhelming enemy. And I do consider Sakazuki to be the main antagonist of Marineford. I mean, technically then Fleet Admiral Sengoku is in charge of the battle, but Sakazuki is the one truly taking command. He was the one keeping the Marines in line by instilling them with the fear of absolute justice. He was the one screwing over the Whitebeard Pirates by concocting plots to turn their allies against them like the squad situation. And he was the one fighting on the front lines with the incredible bravery of being willing to take on an Emperor of the sea 1v1, and quite successfully as well.
well. Because what this event establishes that in terms of raw power, Sakazuki is pretty incredibly close to the ceiling. And one of my favorite panels in this arc is where Whitebeard is raising his weapon and Sakazuki just steps on it and says, nah mate. Because it gives me the same sort of vibe as Luffy stopping Doflamingo from killing Law with his foot. And of course, Sakazuki then goes on to establish himself as one of the most hated yet most effective antagonists in One Piece by actually killing Port Gas D Ace. And not through power, but by through clever mind tactics, which is something that Sakazuki doesn't get anywhere near enough credit for. He is intelligent AF. People tend to think of him as a big chonky magma punch punch man, but his words are far more effective than any physical attack he could conjure. In so many key situations, he always seems to know the exact right thing to say to attain the outcome he desires. And in the case of Podcast DS, Sakazuki emotionally deconstructed him in an instant by hitting on that point of cowardice and accusing Ace of running away. He also went on to shockingly efficiently insult both Whitebeard and Roger, thus opening up Ace's colossal closet of daddy issues, and dismantling Ace mentally before ultimately dismantling him physically. If Sakazuki hadn't known the exact right thing to say at the exact right time, then I believe that Ace would still be alive today. So he's intimidating on all fronts. There is no character flaw to exploit, at least not that we're currently aware of. He has top tier strength, intelligence, and willpower. He's the very most you could ask for in an antagonist in this world, which is only emphasized when Sakazuki is promoted to Fleet Admiral and post time skip Jinbei makes the following comment. Under Fleet Admiral Sakazuki's leadership, Navy headquarters has grown far more powerful and determined than ever before. However, this is where my personal praise of Sakazuki starts to significantly slow down because Sakazuki's post time skip role has been a bit disappointing in comparison to his pre time skip showcase, at least so far. We actually do see him quite frequently, usually between arcs. However, he's always doing one of three things. He's either complaining at his desk, in the middle of a meeting, or taking a phone call. Sometimes mixing the three options together for some mm, spicy variety. But essentially, it's been almost 15 years since the time skip in our real world time. People have started and finished high school two and a half times over. And in that time, Sakazuki hasn't really, hasn't really done anything. I will say that I do like the commentary of leadership. The idea that Sakazuki is a very frontline kind of guy who was always frustrated by the lack of direct actions being taken by the Marines and the world government. And then after attaining the authority to take that action, he finds himself buried in bureaucracy and resource management to the point where the Marines have barely had any action post time skip at all. At least not until recently. Now they're getting too much action. But there's definitely something there that I appreciate. I just don't know if it takes 15 years to make that point. And to be as fair as I can be, this wasn't intentional by Oda. One Piece is a series that just keeps ballooning out of control. And given that Sakazuki is reserved as a final saga villain, he's accidentally being kept waiting by everything else that Oda wanted to do in the meantime. And it was really nice to see him back in action fighting against Bartholomew Kuma on the top of the red line, that very brief moment. But it also reminded me of what I'd really been missing from him. However, my biggest criticism of Sakazuki is how he gets used in extended media. Because in the post time skip era of One Piece, Sakazuki's primary role isn't even in the actual story. In the One Piece franchise, his main role has been a marketing tool for the films. So weirdly enough, apart from the Straw Hat, Sakazuki is the character who appears most in the One Piece movies. He's in film Z, film Gold, Stampede, and film Red. And the trailers and marketing material always make this out to be a big deal. Like, mate, look how big this movie film is. Even Fleet Admiral Sakazuki is in it. This is gonna be big, world-changing stuff. But without fail, on each and every occasion, he's in the movie for all of 30 seconds if he's lucky, usually monologuing from his desk about what's happening in the movie and providing nothing of substance other than sending one of his subordinates to go and actually be involved in the movie. And I'm a lot less forgiving about this than I am with his role in the manga, which to be fair, in the manga, he's doing essentially the same thing. But in this case, it's the franchise extracting every last drop of goodwill that Sakazuki still has from the pre-time skip era, which again, ended almost 15 years ago. He's not getting these cameo appearances to enhance the film. He's getting them so that they can slap his face in the trailer and pretend he's gonna do something. They're tricking you to paying money. And for some contrast, another character that this happens to is Admiral Kizaru, who appears in film Z Stampede and film Red. However, unlike Sakazuki, he's actually important and has major fights in two of those three movies. One of which was against Shanks, Shanks. So Kizaru is such a boss and a fantastic addition to the films, which is the sort of thing that you want from Sakazuki when you see him in the trailers. And look, the only reason why I'm lingering on this point for so long is because post time skip, there's just not a lot else to say about Sakazuki yet in canon material. Realistically, he has almost as many film appearances as he does series canon appearances. So the movies make up a stupidly large chunk of Sakazuki content, which is 
a big mark against him. I feel like I've personally been quite patient. We've been in this post time skip era, again, I'm gonna say it again, from his 15 years now, and I just wanna see the guy do a thing. But that does lead us to the very important point that Sakazuki is an incomplete villain. The first that we've examined on this tier list. Everything we've seen of him so far is a glorified introduction, and the final judgment does need to be reserved for when we do eventually substantially dive into him. Which means that we probably won't have a definitive judgment until the very end of One Piece. And given that that's not now, we do need to take that into account and cut him a bit of slack. I do think that by the end of One Piece, Sakazuki will shed the desk and return to his Marineford Prime, if not greater, and establish himself as one of, and potentially even the best antagonist in the series. But that day is not today. And I think that the best I can do for him right now is an A tier, which is earned almost exclusively through the Marineford arc alone. But I can't wait to see his full potential as an antagonist, and I have no doubt that we will be revisiting this ranking a couple of years down the line. But for now, you let me know in the comments which villain you'd like to see ranked next.